Democracy. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to uh, contribute further to this debate. Um, I just want to go back to the international experience, and I was talking before um, in an earlier uh, contribution to the committee stages about the Katrina story. And I just want the Minister to listen to this because I think it's um, extremely relevant as to why we're talking about the, the, the essential nature of getting this right. Um, and the story that came out of the Katrina um, and all of the international literature, literature that's been studied, but actually this comes from Massey University because we have one of the world experts in this particular field um, in New Zealand. And in fact, he's in Christchurch on Monday. And in fact, he is addressing a seminar on recovery, which I certainly have signed up for. And I hope that others um, in this house do so too. Um, he, but he, what he defined was, who defines the character of recovery? That was the first question, and he said that pre-event politics framed the recovery process. And I want to come back to that, because people have said some pretty harsh things about this side of the House. And yes, we do take them personally, but that's not going to stand in the way of making this work. And what, the second no, thing, the, sec the, second things, the second things around the New Orleans story... The second thing around the New Orleans story well, was this, and I, want to, and I want to make these points very, very clearly, and they are the relationship between local, state and federal, federal government meant chaotic planning. So that's what this bill is designed to address, is to ensure that there isn't chaotic planning. The second thing was that in New Orleans, vulnerable population was marginalised from the recovery process. And I'm not going to let vulnerable communities that I was elected to represent be marginalised in this recovery process, regardless of what the bill says. Domination by urban elites and corporate interests and experts from outside the city and region. And then finally, the most important, pre-event vulnerabilities were re-entrenched in a post-Katrina New Orleans. We must not let that happen. Good the there are members the of the government who have stood there in this House and have accused me and my colleagues of playing politics with this. Well, I want to read to the House an email that I sent to John Key and every member of the Canterbury Earthquake Cabinet Committee, and then I'm going to table it. I've, I sent this behind the scenes, no, no intention other than to get the government to focus on what mattered to my constituents. I sent it on the 1st of March, one week after the February 22nd earthquake, and I talked about TVNZ close-up running a story tonight about a tale of two cities. The east-west -west divide is real, and it has major implications for our city. I live in Bexley, which means I have a very personal and emotional link to what I'm about to say. I have tried to strip this email of that influence and share with you what I know about the people I've been privileged to represent for 10 years now. And I'm not going to read out the entire detail, but I just want people to know that what I've raised with the government was the fact that tolerance levels were lower than they were before because people felt they'd been overlooked after the first earthquake. I said this had implications for law and order and mental health. Secondly was the fear. The fear is that after dark people are vulnerable to the criminal element. I asked for some uh, night curfews around areas with, had no, at, which had no electricity. This was supported by the local police but was not listened to. The other fear was about more serious earthquakes and about tsunami risk for offshore people. I wanted answers that I could share with the people that I have the privilege to represent. Health. I spoke to the people at the Tactical Medical Centre that was set up by the Queensland Mass Unit. I talked about the real problem, which was that we were treating this as a third world city when in fact we had a first world city when we had third world conditions on the eastern side. This is what I was told by the doctor who was running the unit and who had very special expertise to bring to the table because he'd been to disasters in Australia and all around the world. I then went on to talk about access to services and how how difficult it was to spend a cash grant when your, all of your supermarkets and all of your petrol stations were closed. I then talked about Portaloos, but I'm not going to talk about Portaloos here because I am still very upset that the, that the powers that be would not listen to the concerns that were raised genuinely, privately, behind closed doors over and over and over again until finally I had to speak out on behalf of those who elected me to do so. 
Mr. Mr. Chairman. I then went on to talk about the resources of people who live, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I then went on to talk about the resources of people who live in the badly affected areas who don't have the resources available to me, things like steady income, mortgage free, and with family on the other side of town, I could have gone over to my sister's place and had a shower any time over the 16 days that my house was without electricity, but I didn't do that because actually we were being told to stay off the roads for um, non-urgent purposes. And besides which, I was a girl guide and I know how to keep myself clean um, and smelling okay, um, even though I didn't have access to a shower um, for that period of time. These people have no savings, some of the people I represent, not all, because actually this isn't a rich-poor divide either between East and West. We have got some beautiful houses that have been smashed up on the, on the, the river on the side um, on the Bexley uh, wetlands, looking out over the Horseshoe Lake. You know, and so it's not east-west and, and rich-poor, it's just east-west in terms of where the earthquake did its damage. But a lot of these people didn't have three days' worth of food in the cupboard. They didn't have 20-litre water containers. They didn't have transistor radios with batteries. They didn't have um, torches that were working. Mr Chairman, I then went on to talk about the engineering and variation 48, and I won't go into that again because the council hasn't listened to me, and I know that the government is getting Tonkin and Taylor to actually work up some realistic solutions there, and I am grateful, and I want to place on record my admiration for Tonkin and Taylor and the fantastic work that they are doing, working so hard on behalf of our constituents. And finally, I talked about recovery. Everything I've read about recovery post 4 September, largely because of the disappointing efforts post the establishment of the Canterbury Earthquake Recovery Commission, which was believed by the City Council and the Minister to absolve the Council from its CDM responsibilities. Post the 4 September earthquake, international best practice kicked in with the four task groups established, economic environment, social environment, built environment and natural environment. Most of these structures fell apart after the Canterbury Earthquake Recovery Commission was established. I had ridiculous emails from the City Council saying that the Recovery Commission was better because it had seven task groups as opposed to four. The truth is, is that we need to engage with the communities of the East and with the CBD and we have to set aside politics. Politicians should not be the face of recovery. We need someone in charge. And then I've taken out the rest of the email because it had some uh, indication as to who I thought should be in charge, and it's not fair to that individual um, for me to say so. So I've taken that out of the email before I table it. But the reason that I wanted to put this on the record is that we have worked tirelessly on this side of the House to engage with the government, to engage with the council, to engage with our communities and to represent them. In my maiden speech to Parliament, I said that I wanted to be the face of the people that couldn't be seen and the voice of the people who couldn't be heard. And I never realised for one minute that that would have some meaning post an event such as this. But it does have meaning for me because that's the job that we have all been doing. Clayton Cosgrove, Ruth Dyson, Brendan Burns, uh, Jim Anderson and myself, we have worked so hard as constituency MPs elected by our constituents to represent them. And I really resent the fact that we are being criticised by people who have not been elected to represent constituencies in the way that we have. And I know that the Honourable Jerry Brownlee himself has been affected, and I know that his constituents have been affected as well, and he has taken up those concerns as a genuine elected representative of those people, as has Amy Adams on the other side of the House. Amy Adams has also been personally affected, and I think we have to acknowledge the fact that we are all personally affected in some way, shape or form, and that there is work that we need to do, and we need to do it together. The Prime Minister told the Leader of the Opposition that I had been emotionally affected by the earthquake. Well, I'd like to know who wasn't emotionally um, affected by the earthquake, but the emotional effect might be real, but I can tell you what, it hasn't stopped my 
utmost commitment and driven uh, desire to make sure that this works for the people that elected me to represent them, to be their voice, and I will continue to do so. And I know that the Minister is upset with some of the things that have been said, but all I'm saying is please set those aside for the sake of making sure that we get this right. And that's all I really want to say in this debate. Uh, Dr. Kennedy Graham.